Representative Straczynski of the 112th District. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, once again, we find ourselves in this chamber dealing with the situation that should be dealt with at the federal level, but instead we're here in the state of Connecticut, and I believe the term used earlier was end around. I'm all for state rights. I believe strongly in having states having the powers to create laws and enforce their own laws, but some things are best left to the federal government, and I believe this is one of those things. One of the arguments I've been hearing about the reason that this is important and the reason this is our best option is because of our influence. Often people will say Connecticut is left out of presidential elections, that Connecticut is not important enough for visits. While I may not agree with that, I think that recent evidence has showed that people have come, candidates have been here. I think it's more important to look at the numbers. Now, I'm a data person. I've always been a data person. Um, and I think it's important that we look at the math of that argument that Connecticut will gain influence in some way by enacting this, by entering this compact. As we all know, Connecticut has seven electoral votes. And as we also know, total number of electoral votes across the country is 538. Quick math on that, that's 1.3%, which means Connecticut has 1.3% say in the Electoral College. It's not a lot, but you know, we're a fairly small state, but that 1.3% is what we have, it's what we have had, and by listening to those who would say that we would gain influence by entering into this compact, you would think, well, that's gotta, that must increase, that must be going up, we must be getting more of the authority in that. Well, if you look at the numbers going back to 2008, there were a total number of popular votes of 132,454,39. The number of votes in Connecticut that year was 1.6 million roughly. Quick and dirty math on that, 1.24%. That means in 2008, 1.2% of the national popular vote was cast by Connecticut citizens. I think most of you would argue and understand that 1.2 is less than 1.3, which means we're casting less popular votes nationwide as a percentage than the rest of the country, than we would get in a electoral college situation. And so you may say, well, that was 2008, it was one year, maybe it was an outlier. Since I've had time during the debate, I've looked up the numbers from 2012, and the numbers are remarkably similar. 1.2% of the national popular vote was cast by Connecticut citizens. Once again, 1.2%. Still less, still less than 1.3%. 2016, I think we'd all can remember 2016. I did the numbers on that. Also, once again, Connecticut voters cast 1.2% of the total votes in the presidential election. So if we're here today saying that Connecticut is gonna gain influence by entering into a national popular vote compact, I would argue just the opposite. We are going to lose influence. Right now we have 1.3% of the total uh, authority influence on the electoral college and that would drop. So if I'm a presidential candidate or if I'm running a presidential campaign, I'm gonna look at the numbers and say, well, now that Connecticut has entered into the compact, we're certainly not going to go there. They have less influence overall. They're going to focus on the large states because that's what this bill does. This bill gives a lot more authority by percentage, by the numbers, to the large population states. I just got done reading a biography on James Monroe. You may say, why? Why did you pick James Monroe? Well, I'm from Monroe. I represent Monroe. And, and I wanted to know a little bit more about the president and the man that my town was named after. And as you can imagine, as one of the founding fathers, he was instrumental in a lot of what happened in the Constitution and some of the early works of our country. And the compromises that were created were because large states versus big states. Now, James Monroe was from Virginia. He was a big state guy. That's something we probably would debate if he was still here with us. 
but it's important to realize that those issues were argued and debated. And even in the 1700s, in the early 1800s, when our country was founded, they were wise enough to know that they needed to balance that power out. And the best way to do that was with a system that would allow for that influence to be spread across the country, large states, small states. It might not be one person, one vote, but in Connecticut, we would actually lose under this compact. And I'm afraid that today we're just giving more influence to the larger states with more population like Texas, California, New York, Florida. And we're ceding our responsibility, we're ceding our authority as a state. And I, I really would like to believe that this chamber would be unanimous in that we feel Connecticut should have a greater influence in the national election, that we should have greater say, greater authority, more power to say who our next president should be, regardless of political party. If you've been listening for the past five minutes or so, I haven't mentioned a candidate, I haven't mentioned a party, because that does, that's not what this is about. This is about legal compact, which Connecticut would get itself into, which would harm our ability to have influence in the national election. The numbers that I gave you are simple math. It's not political spin, it's not rhetoric, it's simple math. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to go into more detail. I feel I'm not gonna bore the rest of the chamber with more of my statistical analysis on this. But we're simply here playing games with the Constitution. We're playing games with our election process. And I'm afraid that it is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to move our state forward. I think everyone in this chamber, again, would agree we're trying to improve the state of Connecticut. This entering into this compact would move us backwards. We're being deceptive with the Constitution. We're being deceptive with the way we're going about, the way we work our election process here, and the way we have our final say. So, Mr. Speaker, that's why I am opposed to this bill. I encourage my colleagues to vote against it, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative, and your comments weren't boring at all.